This is the People Class Podcast, the official podcast of the People Class. Show your support at patreon.com slash the people class. Send us a shout out at the people class on Twitter and send us your feedback at the people class at gmail.com. Public domain protest song! Home of the People Class Podcast. The People Class Podcast is a podcast consisting of structured weekly class sessions like this one and The Quad, our main show which features organic conversations with the guest speakers, answers to subscriber calls, emails, and chat uh, pertaining to the topic of the week. Our primary focus is to build your awareness of how powerful you truly are in shaping the American economy. We aim to encourage and call our fellow working class Americans to action and start a nationally recognized union of the most diverse, driven, creative individuals this great country has to offer, the American working class. As a reminder, I want to keep the content available for free via YouTube and SoundCloud, so don't feel pressured to subscribe on Patreon. I want to thank you for sticking around, and I hope uh, you end your time with us a little more informed, entertained, and empowered to fulfill your duty as an American to build a better America, not only for ourselves, but for future generations to come. Really quick, I'd like to uh, amend a mistake in the previous session in which I misspoke and cited a 1916 date for the Dutch businessman that arrived uh, with 20 African slaves. I believe I corrected this in the recording. However, I wanted to ensure uh, that we understand that 1619 is the correct date for such a landmark period in the development of our nation. We have already looked at the exploits of the 13th Amendment, which has been successful at sustaining the continued oppression of the poor overall, while principally targeting blacks in the U.S., We learned a little about how the Emancipation Proclamation did not grant unconditional freedom to former slaves and how the 13th Amendment was never meant to prohibit slavery, but to hide it behind the veneer of criminal justice, all the while sustaining continued propagation of racism, stereotyping, prejudgment, and persecution of blacks, then eventually to anyone considered a colored ethnicity. We connected the dots to reveal the motives of private businesses partnering with policymakers, forming profit-driven enterprises with prisons in the form of convict leasing. Yes, prisoners were leased out to businesses for unpaid labor, thrust back into the throes of slavery. And now, let's continue our journey through a history of U.S. labor struggles with Part 3 of our series as we tackle the topic of segregation in the United States. Throughout grade school and higher education in the U.S., we are often presented with many examples of the Anglo influence in world history. We see the overinflated ego that was made manifest through uh, their imperialist campaigns throughout the centuries. 
We see it domestically in the U.S. in the form of the Ku Klux Klan, neo-Nazis, and skinheads. Undoubtedly, white supremacy, regardless of its origin, has played an essential role in shaping the U.S. overall. We needed to pass legislation by the name of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 in 20th century America. We had to create consequences to deter people from prosecuting and murdering people simply based off of the color of their skin. How ridiculous is that? The Civil Rights Act of 1964, originally advocated by JFK and signed into law by Lyndon Baines Johnson, ended segregation in public places and banned employment discrimination on the basis of race, color, religion, sex, or national origin. West Virginia Democratic Senator Robert Byrd actually performed a 14-hour filibuster against the act being passed. What's crazier is that more Republicans supported the civil rights legislation than Southern Democrats. The bill was signed into law by a Republican vote of 73 versus a Democrat vote of 27. Due to a majority cloture vote to end the a total 54-day filibuster against granting civil rights uh, by a 71 to 29 vote. So understand, ladies and gentlemen, at this time, before the Civil Rights Act of 1964 was passed, the, the, the majority of the Democratic Party participated in a 54-day filibuster uh, to argue against or granting black and brown people uh, equal rights, a right to equal treatment as human beings, a right to equal pay, a right to equal opportunity, and ultimately a right to uh, an equally uh, satisfying quality of life during your limited time on this earth. While the Civil Rights Act has reduced the frequency and flagrancy of public lynching, there can be no arguments against its failures to truly protect people of color, black people in particular, as the law is only as effective as those enforcing it. This is made evident in the string of police homicides against unarmed black people, trending for the last decade or so. You would think that former President Barack Hussein Obama would have set the most stringent of civil rights laws to shield his then current and future generations from uh, any, any further racial persecution. However, his inaction in addressing the issue of racial persecution, which resulted in the rise of the Black Lives Matter movement, and a kneeling protest by national football player uh, Colin Kaepernick uh, in order to bring uh, national attention to this epidemic was arguably his greatest failure overall, at least for the black and brown communities that supported his leadership. Everyone in Barack Obama's family, those who don't possess his sociopathic tendencies, need to realize uh, how much of a traitor he is to his own ancestry. His indifference toward the historical treatment of blacks in this country completely trivializes uh, the struggles of his parents, cousins, uncles, aunts, nieces, nephews, grandparents, and grandparents who had to endure for centuries without any respite. I would think it fair to state that there are virtually no black families in which their lineage could be uh, traced back to colonial America that have not been affected by the cornucopia of symptoms associated with being black or black in America. One can understand the legitimate disgust and loathing the black community should have towards Barack Obama. However, uh, we still seem to be enamored with the fact that a black man ran the White House, despite their lives and plights ultimately being ignored. 
Obama never addressed or condemned the string of police uh, prompted lynchings of blacks eight years as leader of the free world. He enforced no convictions for those murders eight years as leader of the free world. He recommended no legislation against it eight years as the leader of the free world. Donald Trump has led the country for the past four years. Eight years as leader of the free world with a known racist in, as his successor, but focused on destroying a candidate promoting social and economic equality, Barack Obama. In 2020, it is open season against, uh, again for black people in America. And with the races in the White House, uh, this behavior is permitted, commended, and the uh, perpetrators of this violence are called, quote unquote, good people by current President Donald Trump. For four years, Obama has led the opposition against Bernie Sanders, someone who has been fighting for social and economic equality for 40 years. Barack Obama might as well tie our nooses and strike us with the whip himself. And I'm going to put out a trigger warning here. Um, it's not meant to offend anyone. But if uh, we are going to keep things real, Obama is the modern house slave or house nigger, or house nigga, if you will. Once again, I don't mean to offend, we just need to put this into context. He doesn't have to endure the hard physical labor as the field slaves. He is a slaver himself, essentially. He manages the field slaves. He notifies his masters of any plans to dissent among the field slaves to thank his benevolent masters for allowing him shade from the hot sun, to thank him for a slightly elevated status versus his followers, to be able to sustain the benefits of direct servitude to power. This example serves to validate the reality that working class Americans have been unwilling participants in a class war for some time. Obama did not impose a Muslim ban, but he raised the bar for deportation of poor working class black and brown immigrants. Obama and his weaponization of ICE, Immigration and Customs Enforcement, awarded him the mantle of deporter in chief. I'll give you a moment to reflect on that. So moving forward with our topic today, what is segregation? Oxford defines it as the action or state of setting someone or something apart from other people or things or being set apart and, quote unquote, the enforced separation of different racial groups in a country, community, or establishment. We are aware of the key tenets involved with segregation in the U.S., racism, domestic terrorism, homicide, Jim Crow laws uh, that legalized segregation, um, separate bathrooms, separate schools, separate eating establishments, the list goes on. We also saw this to some degree with the apartheid uh, campaign in Africa as well. Uh, I'm an avid consumer of stand-up comedy, and I remember a uh, special in which Trevor Noah shared an anecdote on his experience with apartheid. Uh, this is in Africa, once again. Uh, he recalled how his mother would have to uh, let go of his hand and create uh, some extreme distance between her and, and him. You know, he was a child at the time, going as far as to walk on the opposite side of the road from him when approaching uh, white people on the sidewalk. But I would like to present to you a perspective on segregation that is rarely explored. Uh, I am not a, the architect of this particular school of thought. Rather, I aim to guide you through uh, how the methodology has affected uh, solidarity among the working class 
in an organized effort to quell or suppress uh, populist uprisings and to strip power away from poor blacks and non-blacks demanding equal pay and treatment. An article on the American Federation of Labor and Congress of Industrial Organizations, that's the AFL-CIO, may be familiar with this organization. Uh, On their website, there's an article titled A Brief History of Labor, Race, and Solidarity. Uh, A link for this will be posted in the description. So uh, please be sure to visit the site and ingest the entire article as there is so much to unpack. But this article uh, highlights here that, uh, quote, Southern landowners recognized that uh, they could maximize their profits by using African slaves to work their land. And a body of law was implemented to rationalize permanent race-based enslavement. Over the years, uh, after every real or imagined slave uprising, these laws were made harsher and black workers were further stigmatized and dehumanized. Slave rebellions were terrifying to the political authorities, uh, not only because of physical danger uh, they represented to a minority of white elite, but because they exposed the violence required to maintain slavery as a system. Ain't that something? The optics. So, first, we have to come to terms with the fact that immediately uh, following slavery, segregation did not exist immediately uh, following the liberation of slaves and indentured servants. We, we discussed this in last session. Slavery, uh, or excuse me, segregation outside of slavery uh, did not exist in the U.S., and then racial-based social segregation was introduced into the U.S. Understand this. Let's revisit the uh, afore quoted article. It concludes, quote, The slave rebellions were terrifying to the political authorities, not only because of physical danger uh, they represented uh, to a minority white elite, but because they exposed the violence required to maintain slavery as a system. The point I want to extract from that sentence is the following portion. Because of physical danger, they represented to a minority white elite. Now, in the context of the article, the danger presented comes, from, uh, comes in the form of a slave rebellion. Excuse me. However, if you would indulge me for just a minute to read between the lines and egress into the realm of opinion and speculation. The underlying issue manifested through the ensuing racial-based legislation was a distrust of the newly freed slaves who were forced to endure inhumane treatment for generations (laughs) Over two centuries, the white elite feared retribution by the blacks, and rightfully so. The upper-class whites of the southern and northern hemispheres of the nation were uncomfortable with the blacks' assimilation into their pure, clean, intelligent societies. It is important to remember that poor white immigrants and indentured servants were also struggling economically, and they too had a bone to pick with the upper echelon of society. They had been fighting at the time for a more balanced workday, as no labor laws existed before 1864 regarding worker welfare or worker protection. And they were subject to grueling 12 to 14 hour days, along with pre-adolescence, uh, children uh, uh, aged 10 to 13 years old, and, and hazardous warehouses and factories that provided no protection or comfort. Um, the, uh, ventilation was always an issue in these, in these places. Uh, the term sweatshop uh, should ring a bell. Human beings are social creatures by nature. And we understand that it is in our best interest to seek out and participate in social activities and forming communities. This is how we mitigate the threats to our survival as a species, uh, as these social systems instill a sense of stability, security, emotional support, physiologically 
facilitate the successful continuation of our species through procreation or reproduction, if you will. This also drives the habit of seeking and coalescing with similar individuals, uh, similar in preferences, needs, ideologies, value systems, class status, etc. We do this because we understand that it is easier to achieve a goal in a broad sense with the assistance of others as opposed to uh, taking a crack at it independently. So what happens when a class of people are shunned and shirked into the outskirts of society? We just answered that inquiry, uh, didn't we? So just as human nature plays out, the newly freed impoverished blacks uh, join the ranks of the poor whites and immigrants. Sometimes in rural areas outside of the bounds of the social hubs. Sometimes within the hustle and bustle of the city. Take a look around your city on your way to the grocer for the evidence. Drive past the strip malls closed for the business day. Scan your freeway underpasses on the way to work. Should you be so fortunate, the irony of that term is not lost on me. Uh, walk through downtown after hours. A lot of major cities have a section endearingly referred to as Skid Row. Is the picture clearer now? Tent cities are the extreme symptom of a system that intentionally keeps people economically oppressed. I don't know about you, but I have never seen a segregated tent city. That does not disapprove they have never existed, but I have never seen uh, race wars within the homeless communities either. Once again, that does not disprove their existence. I just have no recollection of witnessing this myself. No, the homeless of those communities work together. They canvass areas as a group on no-income fundraising campaigns. We have coined this as begging or panhandling. Then they come together at the end of each business day and pull the donations they collected individually and share meals. And yes, some of the leisures that we indulge in as well as the vices that we often turn to when afflicted with diseases of despair, despite their level of wealth, because the poor are human after all. They keep watch for each other at night, else risk further maltreatment like police harassment, theft, assault, and even murder. It is not uncommon in the U.S. for us to turn to the news every couple of months to see Usually an upper-class white adolescent or adult has murdered a homeless person just for entertainment. Those afflicted by segregation were often pushed toward the outskirts of society, off Main Street, into the rural areas or areas within the city that local government chose not to invest in. What motivates someone to behave in this matter is beyond me, other than to deliberately demoralize, dispirit, and disorganize a people. It is essentially in the lines of a mental disorder called sociopathy, a pattern of antisocial behaviors and attitudes including manipulation, deceit, aggression, and a lack of empathy for others. Symptoms of sociopathy include glibness and superficial charm. Take a look at uh, our political candidates when they're running for uh, office. Manipulative and conning, they never recognize the rights of others and see their self-serving behaviors as permissible. Grandiose, sense of self, pathological, lying, lack of remorse, shame or guilt, shallow emotions, incapacity for love and a need for stimulation. And I'm sure you can check off every one of those features of a sociopath for every president we have had in office since the Reagan administration. It is a mental health disorder that needs to be addressed as urgently as climate change, as when these mentally disordered sociopaths are allowed to coalesce within our societal and economic power infrastructures, their actions often become lethal. I'll also add that we need to petition the American Psychiatric Association to classify racism as a mental disorder in the DSM-5. If this is a campaign you want to start, uh, please email me at thepeopleclass at gmail.com with the sub or subject line uh, DSM, Delta Sierra Mike. 
Innocent humans in the Middle East have uh, been relentlessly subject to American-induced war and terrorism on their citizens in the form of foot soldiers, tanks, planes, indiscriminate carpet bombing, and drone strikes since Bush seniors, ladies and gentlemen. Since 9-11, occurring every single day, matching the frequency of domestic mass shootings in the U.S., if not more, since 2001 lasting at least another 20 years into the future here in America. Uh, that is 2040, ladies and gentlemen, uh, with no foreseeable end in sight. This is what happens when we neglect mental health and education in a society of people. If these examples were not outliers, the tyrants and dictators of this world would not stand out in the world history books. We have to admit, not every leader that has ever existed uh, behaved uh, in this manner or has behaved in this manner here in the U.S. This system of segregation ultimately led to the uh, modern practice of gerrymandering. Once again, keeping people apart, keeping them separated, which is the practice intended to establish an unfair political advantage for a particular party or group by manipulating uh, district boundaries um, as to favor one party or class. I'll go ahead and give you that de definition again. Gerrymandering is the practice intended to establish an unfair political advantage for a particular party or group by manipulating district boundaries, as is on a map, uh, as to favor one party or class. The practice's inception is cited as being utilized in the U.S. as early as 1788, according to Wikipedia. The process of redistricting, the process of drawing electoral district boundaries in the United States, occurs every 10 years. Wikipedia continues to explain, Throughout the 20th century and since then, the U.S. court system have has deemed extreme cases of a gerrymandering to be unconstitutional, but has struggled with how to define the types of gerrymandering and standards to be used uh, to define when redistricting maps are unconstitutional. So uh, ultimately, the Supreme Court of the United States ha has affirmed in the Miller v. Johnson case of 1995 that uh, racial gerrymandering is a violation of constitutional rights and upheld uh, decisions against uh, redistricting uh, purposely devised or based on race. However, most importantly, uh, the U.S. Supreme Court has struggled to define when partisan gerrymandering occurs as their attempts to regulate the questionable practice led to the U.S. Supreme Court to ultimately conclude that the issue is beyond mitigation by the federal court system. So the United States Supreme Court essentially washed their hands of the matter and decided to leave further mitigation or regulation of gerrymandering to be handled at the state and local levels. Okay, and this has led to some communities demanding fair representation, moral responsibility, accountability, a checks and balances of this system to establish independent redistricting commissions and oversight team. Okay, so once again, uh, you know, lo local communities taking uh, things into their own hands because of the laissez-faire approach to uh, neo-capitalist uh, system of government. So in regards to gerrymandering and redistricting, the unfavorable areas, uh, speaking of the uh, electoral constituency, be it ethnicity, economic class, or p political ideology, unfavorable areas were often subjected to what's known as redlining. I'm sure you've heard this before, even on the mainstream, such as uh, MSNBC and Fox News. Redlining is, uh, as defined by Wikipedia, is the systematic denial of various services by government agencies, local governments, as well as the private sector to residents of specific, uh, most notably black neighborhoods or communities, uh, either directly or through uh, the selective 
uh, raising of prices. So local uh, municipal taxes are usually higher in these communities, for example. I realized this during the decade I resided, I resided in San Diego County uh, in the state of California. I lived in Chula Vista, California, which was a fairly desirable location in southern San Diego County. It was a military melting pot of a town, and the local economy was supported by the uh, neighboring uh, Tijuana uh, border 15, or 15 minutes south. Upon visiting a Walmart in a province named National City, just 10 minutes due north uh, via the 5 or 805 interstate freeways, uh, I noticed that I paid an 8.25% tax rate on my bill as opposed to a 7.25% tax rate uh, in the wealthier province. The same went for my uh, shopping bill in El Cajon, California, which is, you know, just another uh, 15 minutes uh, east uh, from that location. Uh, so why was the tax rate higher in these areas? They're both provinces of San Diego County, Overall, San Diego County is considered a very affluent and desirable uh, location. Well, National City and El Cajon in particular, these areas disproportionately house the highest percentage of low-income blacks in particular. Okay, Wikipedia continues, uh, neighborhoods with high proportion of minority residents are more likely to be redlined than other neighborhoods with similar household incomes, uh, housing age and type, and other uh, determinants of risk, but different racial compositions. So rent is usually higher in these areas too. Uh, these areas have been so affected by the neglect of the system that other social safety nets had to be implemented by, federal, by the federal government to control the inevitable mass of homelessness uh, of a whole race of people due to predatory systems, right? Uh, one of these safety nets is called Section 8. I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with uh, this program or have at least heard the term. Uh, in 1937, Section 8 of the Housing Act authorizes federal intervention in the payment of rental housing assistance to provide landlords on behalf of low-income households in the United States. Since 1965, Section 8 of the Housing Act of 1937 has been managed by the Department of Housing and Urban Development, or HUD, which is part of the Great Society Program, a program working toward the total elimination of poverty and racial injustice, which was founded in 1965 by the 36th U.S. Democratic President, Lyndon Baines Johnson, Yes, there was a time when the United States had moral democratic leadership in the White House. So uh, let's dissect this a little further uh, as Wikipedia continues. Um, quote, while the best known examples of redlining have involved a denial of financial services such as banking or insurance, other services such as health care or even supermarkets have been denied to residents. In the case of retail businesses like supermarkets, purposely locating their stores and practically far away from targeted residents results in a redlining effect. Now, for any of you who have grown up in, um, let's just say, South Central Los Angeles, the hood, the barrio, anywhere in the United States, wherever you may be listening, the reason why you usually have to drive out or take the bus out to uh, get access to many of the uh, conveniences of big box retail and dining establishments, um, clothing establishments, <laughs> um, one, they just don't want to invest in your neighborhood, but this is a tactic. It takes up your time. Uh, it makes it harder for you to go out and consume these goods and take uh, part of the services because you're too busy working two and three jobs to barely pay your rent and keep food on the table, okay? Understand this. Uh, the lower income areas are often flooded by predatory check cashing services, lending services, and loan sharks who offer higher interest rates on loans from uh, the few banks bold enough 
or <laughs> sinister enough uh, to set up brick and mortar establishments in those neighborhoods. We see an influx of rent to buy retailers offering uh, the same goods provided as the big box retailers with an increased markup on the sell price. They, they offer credit contracts that slowly drain the meager income of those unfortunate enough to fall prey to the rent to own campaign appeals. This is why the local convenience uh, liquor store is the most common business found within the poorer class communities. Um, not only are those business, businesses capitalizing on the circumstance, uh, undoubtedly some are, but sadly this is also just an attempt to provide consumer goods to communities that the national and global uh, corporate interests choose to neglect. All right, people are just doing the best they can, honestly. Hospitals uh, with emergency triage services are often unavailable in red line districts and neighborhoods. Uh, their, their locations are more difficult for you to get to, ensuring another obstacle towards uh, ensuring the survival of those who have experienced life-threatening trauma in those communities. Local private hospitals refuse to render emergency and life-sustaining services to those who cannot afford it in these enfranchised neighborhoods. And eventually we start seeing the formation of local urgent care facilities in a dual effort to capitalize on the circumstances and also provide a service that refuses to make itself available to those they deem unworthy of health prosperity. Funding for educational programs are often left behind and steadily attacked and reduced when the state is tasked with budgeting the economy for the next fiscal year. Protective social services such as police and fire departments are also underfunded, underregulated, and understaffed in these areas. As you can see, redlining entraps the poor, and poor blacks in the U.S. in particular, in a cycle of poverty by outright barring their inclusion and participation in the social systems that allow a modern civilization to function and thrive. Let's explore how segregation further exploits poor black and the poor in general by taking a look at the quality of income available versus their white upper class counterparts. In 2016, Roberto A. Ferdman, a Washington Post op-ed, uh, challenged us to question the ethics of the U.S. tipping system by exploring its race-based origins in slavery in his article titled, I Dare You to Read This and Still Feel Good About Tipping. He reminds us in this post that, quote, in a tip-based system, Non-white servers make less than their white peers for equal work, end quote. The article brings attention to the fact that, quote, the federal tipped minimum wage, which allows restaurants to pay tipped workers as little as $2.13 per hour in the United States, is rooted in a regrettable period in this country's past. Slavery, end quote. The article continues to explain that tipping, quote, creates a two-tiered system that allows for an employee, a worker, to not be paid at all by their employer. An idea that an employer shouldn't have to pay workers uh, essentially because they're valueless, end quote. It is explained that tipping was a practice adopted by Americans who traveled to Europe between 1858 and 1865. However, in the U.S., the workers who, in, who earned tips were almost exclusively black, newly freed black slaves. Europeans eventually came to view the tipping system as an in inadequate system for accumulating income through their labor. And a populist anti-tipping movement caused the country to abandon the system altogether. Once again, we see a global shift in what is deemed acceptable, humane treatment to the working class, but in the U.S., greed remains supreme. The tipping system in the U.S. was initially embraced as a means to keep an ethnicity of people off of the social hierarchy ladder, dependent, disrespected, and economically deflated. 
I hope by this time in our session, you are able to see how segregation has played a pivotal role in the sustained oppression of a race and now a class of people in order to maintain a system of free and low cost labor, which is the engine hidden under the veneer of the Ferrari frame and body that is the American economy. That veneer is the stock market, which is always booming and doing phenomenal, while everyone earning an hourly wage have to scrape by with the best they can. As a supplement to today's session, and I thought it was very timely uh, as I was researching the topic, I want to also recommend visiting Renegade Cuts' YouTube or Patreon page, okay? And I'll watch his video essay uh, titled uh, Misinformation for Fun and Profit. The host, Leon Thomas, uh, briefly touches on today's topic and introduces the idea of uh, segregation being a wedge issue or a divisive political issue uh, that is raised in hopes of uh, attracting or uh, alienating an opponent's supporters that allowed for its implementation and more importantly as a tool to keep the newly freed working class from uniting in solidarity to demand equal uh, income and treatment. Once again, this is a uh, perspective on slavery or a lesson on slavery that is not uh, often addressed. Uh, it is certainly hardly have ever addressed in our higher education as far as really breaking down the motives behind the system of segregation. Because remember, uh, segregation did not immediately come into uh, action as slavery was abolished through the Emancipation Proclamation. Segregation did not exist for about 20 years after that. Poor blacks and white former indentured servants and poor white migrants were all working along with each other just fine. The oppressors were afraid of losing their power because um, how do you fight such a mass of people than uh, with leaning on government legislation to do it? If you don't uh, take away anything else from today's session, it is this. Segregation at one point in America outside of racial uh, slavery did not exist. It was not a thing. Once the poor working class began uniting and working with each other and living amongst each other peacefully in their communities, segregation was introduced as a way to keep the masses fractured and shattered and unable to achieve a uh, unity and a mutual goal. Here's what I'm trying to say. And for the uh, religious uh, folk out there, um, remember to go back and revisit the Tower of Babel, okay? And this is why unity is such a threat. Unity amongst the working class against the corporate interests here, the oligarchy in America, is such a threat. Revisit the Tower of Babel. Once everyone was able to unite, um, in that example, under one language, but uh, under one goal, uh, they became a threat to God himself to the point that he had to um, create confusion and dissent amongst the people who were just simply trying to build a tower to reach him, to see him. He destroyed the tower and gave them all different languages in which the factions could not understand each other. This is your God. Uh, <laughs> so um, once again, not to offend um, anyone's beliefs, but uh, just take these examples into account and look at them and apply them to the world that you live in today in 2020. So I would like to go ahead and bring an end to today's session. I uh, want to invite you all to the People Class Patreon, uh, the People Class YouTube, and the People Class uh, SoundCloud uh, pages. Uh, send us a shout out via email.
and let's get a dialogue started guys i, I would really like to get um start getting you know a, a couple of clips uh from a few dozen people if possible um, so that we can go ahead and put up on YouTube and just release for um, the masses, just everyone venting uh, for a few minutes to this corrupt political uh, system and these uh, these hypocritical uh, per corrupt politicians who are trying to uh, take more liberties from you. So please send me an email in the subject line, uh, 15 minutes of flame. Okay, guys, uh, I would like to also thank the essential workers I'm at home right now as well, um, awaiting a awaiting a uh, diagnosis for a positive or negative COVID test as um, a customer in the store that I worked in uh, as a reflex removed his mask to sneeze while I was working with him. So um, be safe out there. Uh, try to keep yourselves as safe as you can. Uh, please don't feed into the rhetoric and do everything you can to um, keep yourselves alive and fighting to change things uh, for a better America. Okay. Stay vigilant. Thank you for tuning in to another session of the people class podcast, the official podcast of the people class. I hope you found the information shared in today's session enlightening, or at the very least, I'll raise some questions. I extend an invitation to join us for more weekly sessions. And remember, our work does not stop here. Get active, organize, and take control over your destiny as an American working class person. Class dismissed. Long live Wisconsin It's not the left, it's not the right It's up and down and that's the fight It's a world of new